I haven't been to upstate New York. I've been to New York City and I apologize for my dogs in advance. <laughs> no, hey, 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 stop it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we are live. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Dyslexia Talk. Uh, I can't talk today. Welcome to Dyslexia Coffee Talk with our very special guest, Dr. David Kilpatrick. I am so excited to have you on today. So many parents are really excited to have you on today. So thank you for taking time to, to join us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to sort of get, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to get this question out. I don't know why the English language is failing me today, but <laughs> I think it's important to sort of start off with maybe explaining the difference between phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, because I really want to talk about the development of phonological awareness, but I think that people need to understand the difference between the two. And, you know, you've written so much about phonological awareness and phonological proficiency that I think first differentiating between the two is really critical. Okay, well, um, I don't know if you can read the, the top book on the bookshelf, but it's the, it's the Cambridge Greek lexicon. I happen to, I, I, the closest thing I have to a second language is classical Greek. So I, I have to make use of it somehow because you can't talk to anybody. They all died 2000 years ago. Uh, but anyway, so uh, in classical Greek, phonos meant voice or sound. Um, and we use the term phonology to refer to the sounds related to spoken language, both in terms of producing the sounds and perceiving the sounds. By the way, uh, we had quite a snowstorm, so that's my neighbor across the street uh, with a snow snowblower, <clears throat> if, if you hear some background noise. <laughs> so uh, in that, we need to distinguish between that and what we would think of as just generic auditory stuff. See, I know that I know that's a snowblower, not a truck going by or an airplane. Why? Because I have auditory memory. And so that has to do with just environmental sounds, but phonology has to do with sounds related to speech. Now, anything related to speech, syllables, et cetera, all of that comes under phonology. But phonemes are the smallest unit in spoken language that allow us to distinguish one word or syllable for another. So you're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to apologize in advance for my upstate New York accent, but had and hat, the reason we can tell them apart is because uh, they differ by only a phoneme. <clears throat> now had and box, we can tell apart very easily because they don't share any phonemes. So in the English language, we have very few words. You can count on one hand how many words we have that are made up of just one phoneme. We have I, first person singular, or I. We have awe, like you're in awe of something. We have O, like I owe you money. Uh, and, and, and we have you uh, like E-W-E -E, type of sheep, that's it. Those are all one single phoneme. All other words in English are, are, have more than one phoneme, but then they get stitched together um, through what they call fancy terms, co-articulation. So if you, now step, stepping back from that, our alphabetic writing system is designed to capture those phonemes. And if you have a difficult time noticing the phonemic structure of the spoken language, you're gonna have a hard time learning to read. So phoneme awareness is a critical skill for learning to read. If you're a good reader, you have it, even if you were never taught it. But mm -hmm. for children that were not blessed with that degree of phonological skills, uh, it's something that really has to be directly taught. Um, yeah. Um... I know that you've spoken in the past too about the evolution of language and you know alphabetic language versus a lo logographic language. Am I getting that differentiation correct? Um, where it's a symbol to represent a word, um, and the, you know how language has evolved and why explicit instruction and phonemic awareness is so critical. Yeah. So uh, language was first. Well, language has been around for a long time, but written language has been around since about, for about 5,500 years. And, the, and it was invented multiple times, Egyptians, Chinese, um, in, the, in the Near East, we, we call Middle East here, um, you had cuneiform. In each one of those attempts at written language, each character represented a whole word. So it's referred to as an ideograph or 
um, logograph. There, there are different ways they refer to that type. But it wasn't until about 1500 BC or so that in ancient Phoenicia, which we now call modern Syria, that someone said, hey, you know, when we talk, we keep using some of the same sounds. I think that was the very first speech pathologist. I don't know, first speech therapist, I don't know. But so what they did was they created uh, an alphabet based on 22 different characters. And that original, what they now call Proto-Phoenician alphabet survives in modern Hebrew and Arabic. But the Greeks took it and they, oh, there were no vowel symbols, only consonant symbols in that original alphabet. That's true today for Hebrew. And the, uh, the Greeks took that, changed the look of the letters and added vowels, thanks to them. And so the, the, the alphabet was invented to try to make it a lot easier. You don't have to learn thousands of different characters to learn to read. You need, you need to learn 22 in the original alphabet and that's it and you can learn to read. So um, that is very important because instead of a whole word, you have to deal with t, m, r, s. Those are individual phonemes. And if you're not noticing those elements within speech, you're going to have a hard time reading an alphabet-based writing system. Right. And I just realized my microphone was like three feet away from me, so I was okay. trying to reach it um, so everybody could hear me. But um, so, yes. And... Okay, I'm gonna get this question out, I swear. Do you ever have days where you just, you find it difficult to speak? I don't, I don't understand what that is, but some days I just can't seem to get my words out. But, um, with everything, with the development of uh, phonemic awareness, being able to decode, um, where I wanna go with this is, did you by any chance have the opportunity to listen to Emily Hanford's six part sold a story series. Yeah. Yep. There was a lot of backlash on that podcast series about what some people felt was, was its over emphasis on decoding skills and that other critical parts of building a skilled reader were left out of that conversation. And I'm curious what your thoughts were on, on, on that conversation. Well, it comes to mind as we speak here about overemphasis. So we all know that if you're going to exercise, it's important to do aerobics, you know, things that get the heart rate going, uh, but also some kind of strength training, et cetera. So I've had this problem with my up, kind of upper to middle back for a long time. And so I went and I've got physical therapy. And so suddenly I'm overemphasizing exercises and stretching related to the back. I think that's a problem. No, it's because that is where the deficit is. And so is she overemphasizing decoding? Well, her goal is, I don't think, to talk about reading in general and reading comprehension in general. She's trying to talk about that deficit area in the way instruction has been delivered over the last number of years. So if, if their concern is that the instruction is only focusing on that and not on other things, then they have a great point. But I don't think that's her point. I think they'd be missing the point if they think she's overemphasizing. So just like you'd almost say, Dave, Dave, look, you're doing too many back exercises and too many back stretches. Something's wrong with this, right? It, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to follow. Yeah, and I, from my point of view, I definitely agree with you because I felt like it was a series that was focusing on the deficits within instruction, and mm -hmm. she really seems to be trying to shed some light on the difference between balanced literacy, you know, slash more of a whole language approach to, to literacy than, you know, what everybody's been referring to as the science of reading, which is, you know, I'm going to refer to it more as structured literacy today and being able to focus on the pillars of reading. But your work is so critical in that foundational space of a developing reader and why that is so critical in order to finally, you know, reach the part of the rope where you're truly a, a truly a fluent and skilled reader, right? Um, and we've spoken before, and I really want to sort of circle onto the idea of orthographic processing as well, because I think that you have a great explanation there. And as the parent of a child who struggles with orthographic processing, 
I think that that's something that would definitely help people understand from a contextual point of view. Yeah, um, just a not really technical point, but just a little side note point. Um, I try to avoid the term processing as much as I can. I, occasionally I have to use the term, but processing usually means something's going on between point A and point B. <laughs> that's, what it's, uh, that's what it's saying. So I think maybe to sharpen our conversation a little bit, we can talk about orthographic memory. And the reason I say that is because the term orthographic processing has a history in the reading research that would take me a little bit far afloat and may not be uh, directly relevant or at least not directly central to what we're talking about here. So orthographic memory, here we go with those Greek terms. So orthos means straight or correct in classical Greek. And uh, it, you think about an orthodontist straightens your teeth, orthopedic doctor straightens your bones, so to speak. Uh, and then graphos, we, we use in our language like graphic to mean like a drawing, but in classical Greek, it meant a writing and even often referred to their individual letters of their alphabet, it, among other things. And I just found out, because that's a brand new uh, ancient classical Greek dictionary, that there was a whole separate word, orthographia. I, I just learned that. I mean, I've known those other root words. And it means the correct way to write something and the correct way to spell something. And so orthographic means the correct spelling. Um, M-E-E-T is the correct spelling of when you interact with someone. Uh, and M-E-A-T has something that you might eat. And so uh, both of them have a different orthography, different spelling pattern, and they clue us into a different word and a different meaning. Um, you know, M-E-T-E, -E, it's not a very common word, but it is a word in English. And uh, so that means something different as well. So M-E-T-E -E is not the correct orthography for when you, when you interact with a person. So, Orthographic memory is, I remember all three of those. I have stored away, and you have stored away, and skilled readers have stored away, those three different orthographic representations of a verbalization. It's the same verbalization, but it's a different representation. Now, I'm using words that we call homophones, fancy word for words that sound alike, but they're, but they're actually different words. Uh, but this applies to everything. So you could have... Um, you know, just a, a normal everyday word that doesn't sound like anything else. And you still have to know what the precise orthography is. So um, one thing that those with dyslexia lack, and, and remind me if I don't come back to this to talk about the term dyslexia and, and where some researchers are moving with that term. But what dyslexic individuals lack is good orthographic memory. They're not good at remembering words. So they don't build up that data bank of familiar words. Skilled adult readers have tens of thousands of words stored away in long-term memory and in their orthographic memory and for instant retrieval. But struggling readers build that too slowly that uh, they, they might need to see a word, we don't even know for sure, but they may need to see a, a word 10, 15, 20, 25 times before finally it's stored away in orthographic memory. And where uh, we know from various studies that children from second grade on that are good readers only need to see a new word one to four times. So uh, the key feature of dyslexia that cuts across all alphabetic writing systems is that they are uh, slow readers, they're disfluent. Now what brings about fluency? That's a whole nother interesting topic, but uh, some, I'm taking a cue from some folks that did research down at Florida State University, Joseph Torgerson and colleagues that said, you know what, the biggest factor that makes us fast and accurate readers, or I should say accurate and fast because accuracy is important, would be how many words you know in a passage that you're reading that are jumping out at you instantly. So if you have a large data bank of familiar words, this goes by a few names. Sometimes teachers call it a sight word vocabulary. Researchers sometimes call it an orthographic lexicon. Now a lexicon is just a fancy word for dictionary, a mental dictionary. So the orthographic lexicon is that pool of familiar words that jump out at us instantly when we see it. We don't have to put effort into it, it's effortless. So if you have a large orthographic lexicon, you approach a passage, all the words jump out at you. You're fluent, you're accurate and you're quick. But if you have a limited orthographic lexicon, there are going to be words in that passage you don't know, and it's going to slow you down. It's going to hinder fluency. Now, that's not the only factor involved in fluency, but it seems to, to, to account for the lion's share of, of who's fluent and who isn't fluent. So that is like a universal 
characteristic of those with dyslexia across languages. They're not, they're not really fluent because they don't have that large sight vocabulary. They're not good at remembering words. In English, English speaking countries, we have another characteristic and that is accuracy. We have a problem with accuracy. So if you are a child in Spain or, or Italy and you have dyslexia, it may take you longer to learn the code, but that code is so much more consistent, you eventually do learn it for, for many of the children with dyslexia. So they don't have accuracy issues like our kids with dyslexia have, but they still have the issue of fluency because they're not building up that data bank of familiar words. And so they're reading very slowly, accurately, but slowly. Where our kids, not accurately because there's so, so many words that uh, don't align neatly between pronunciation and print. Yeah. So you told me to remind you to circle back on dyslexia. Yes. One of the, uh, a, a term that's gaining some um, momentum in the research, I don't know if I want to say to replace the term dyslexia, and it's a mouthful, unfortunately, it's word level reading disability or word or in a softer version of it would be word level reading difficulty. And the reason, two, two reasons I think that some researchers are preferring this. One is that there's a lot of inaccurate information out there about the nature of dyslexia that's been floating around for over hundred years. It doesn't have to do with visual spatial perceptual problems. They're not seeing things backwards. That's all popular lore. So word level reading difficulty or word level reading disability that dispenses with that because people are like, what, you know? And so now you can fill it with the meaning that it should be filled with. But there's a second reason why researchers are seeming to prefer that. And that is, uh, hold on a second here. There we go, I had another, oop. All right, I had another monitor on the side here that kept flashing on and off. <laughs> the other reason is that, um, Interestingly, one researcher put it as it's more portable. What do you mean portable? It can apply across different disability areas. So traditionally, we have been reluctant to say this child has a mild intellectual disability and dyslexia. Why? Because we've sort of thought of dyslexia as for individuals with more typical or even superior language abilities. But a person with an intellectual disability has below average uh, types of uh, language skills. And yet we know kind of the anatomy of the skills that are important for word level reading. And so the reasons why a child with 113, which is a very strong IQ score, is struggling in word reading are the same reasons, same possible set of reasons that a child with a 70 IQ is struggling. I like to use an analogy of basketball. If you were to uh, be asked to coach a high school basketball team, you hold tryouts, you pick a team, and then you pick a starting lineup. You can be pretty confident that the individuals uh, who are in that starting lineup are superior com compared to that original large pool of, of potential players. They're superior at dribbling, passing, shooting, and playing defense, because those are the skills you need for basketball. Well, if you were asked to do a high school Special Olympics team and you had kids with a variety of disabilities, I can tell you that the high school team in that league that's going to do the best and win the most games are the ones that have the students that are best at dribbling, passing, shooting, and playing defense. There aren't a separate set of skills for playing basketball if you have autism or ADHD. Uh, there is a, um, it's the same set of skills. Now, coaching that team is gonna be a lot harder for a lot of reasons. Maybe there'll be some language issues. You might have to repeat things. You have to do more demonstrations. Maybe kids are not paying attention, et cetera. Certainly it's gonna be harder, but it's still the same skills. So in a, in a similar manner, there are different types of skills involved in reading for a child with a 70 IQ, word reading this is, a child with a 70 IQ and a child with 113 IQ. They're the same underlying skills. Now the child with a 70 IQ is gonna be challenged by the reading comprehension. There's no question about that. So they may be able to read words and not understand them. But our goal should be to make sure that all children, even children that have lower language skills, are really good at word reading. Of course, it may take longer, but any, anyone that's worked with a lot of kids in a special educational context, they come across kids with very low intelligence and yet their word reading is fine. And we treat them like there's some sort of savant. No, no, those are things that kids with lower language skills can learn. It may take longer, but they can learn those. And the re here's the reason, uh, back to uh, Joseph Torgerson, who I've relied on uh, quite a bit, his research and his colleagues' research, 
what they say is we want children when they leave high school, if they have lower language skills, we want their word reading to be such that their language comprehension and reading comprehension match each other. So if a child has a 70 IQ and they're 18 years old and are, are, are leaving high school with the, with the language abilities of a fourth grader or fifth grader, we want their word re their reading comprehension to be that of a fourth grader or fifth grader, mm -hmm. as opposed to say a second grader because their word reading is way down at a first grade level because they have dyslexia on top of the intellectual disability, but we don't want to call it dyslexia. So if we are able to correct that, sending a kid out into the world with a fourth or fifth grade reading comprehension level is giving them a lifelong gift. They're not getting going out into the world with a second grade reading comprehension. So that's the second reason why there, there seems to be a, a, a not a fast shift, but a slow shift to this term word level reading difficulty or disability. I like to say difficulty. Uh, some folks are saying disability, but the reason I say difficulty is not to soften it, but just to include a wider uh, range of folks, folks that are not low enough to say be considered to have a reading disability based on uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So um, because we have more kids that are not going to be considered to have a reading disability that are still not good readers and could be better readers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm intrigued about what you just said for, for multiple reasons. And the first thing that automatically pops into my head is I know that when he just turned 14. So at 14, it's not quite as big of a deal as it was maybe a couple of years ago. But I, I recognize that when he's mentally or physically tired, he has a harder time communicating. Um, you know, he can't pull the words out of his brain that he's trying to, to reference when he's, when he's having a conversation with you. Um, you know, I even, I wrote a blog piece about it at one point because he was so frustrated in the car with me one day that he slapped himself on the head and said, oh, my brain. <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of thought that dyslexia is kind of more, I think, than just reading the words itself, at least within the community perception. So if we rename it, word level reading disability, how do, how do we encompass some of the other parts of what people think of dyslexia being a part of? Well, I have a, if you give me a second here, I have a little quote for you that can kind of help with that a little bit. Um, let's see. And, okay, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna read this to you. This is, uh, was a, based on a review of research on dyslexia. In other words, they sit down and look at all the different findings about dyslexia. And it's from 10 years ago, a little, little over 10 years ago now, from 2012. And it was by the folks down at Florida State University. And they are a funding hub of the National Institute of Child Health and Development mm -hmm. on these uh, research on these very type of issues. And this is what they said. They said, although some individuals with dyslexia have weaknesses in a variety of areas, impaired phonological processing appears to be a universal cause of dyslexia. So we, and there's two reasons why they said universal cause, I believe. Number one, and I actually ran up by the first two authors at conferences talking to them. One, one of them I, I've known for years and the other one I didn't know. But anyway, the two reasons why they said it's a universal as opposed to a, a common cause. Uh, number one is that there are certain characteristics of, of weaknesses on certain skills that kids with dyslexia have. There's what's referred to as a phonological core deficit. And if you look at some of the types of features, that would be a weakness in phonemic blending or phonemic uh, awareness or analysis, uh, rapid automatized naming, phonologic working memory, a weakness in learning letter names and letter sounds, or weakness in sounding out nonsense words. So those five or six different things um, are, you're going to find if a child is struggling in reading, they do poorly on one or more of those. They don't get a clean bill of health in those. And yet, with typically developing readers, it's hard to find difficult enough items of those sorts that I just mentioned to, to trip them up. So there's a bit of a divide there. The second reason is that for the last 50 years, they've been studying dyslexia scientifically. We haven't come up with a, a, a causal, another causal explanation for it. Mm -hmm. And believe me, if someone comes up with a, an alternative causal explanation for dyslexia, they're gonna go down in history. So there's certainly a motivation for it. It's not like, you know, it's not like, uh, uh, there's no motivation to, to try to dig deeper. And believe me, they've turned over just about every rock you can imagine. Now, one of the things that I think that you're hinting at, I had a, um, a, a discussion with someone who was part of a, a, 
a dyslexia association and it was a casual conversation that we were having with a few people and she insisted because her husband and, and son were had dyslexia she insisted dyslexia is more than just about reading words and it's like well you know it, yeah um it probably is because it has to do with the integrity of the phonological system and that can spill out in things but also there's other things that are associated we we have a fancy term we call it comorbid so if you have dyslexia you're more likely to have say an atten attention issues um and so those could be a part of it or executive functioning issues but they aren't the causal source of the reading problem per se because you have people with attention issues or executive function issues that are perfectly fine readers so for your you know big big college word here for today is uh is um epiphenomenal. So epiphenomenal means something that is associated with a particular phenomenon. Epi, there you go, classical Greek, on or upon. Uh, epiphenomenal means that something is often associated with something, but it doesn't have a causal relationship. So for example, many, many children with Down syndrome have a very significant singular palm crease that we don't have. And I don't think we think that the palm crease caused the intellectual disability or vice versa. It's epiphenomenal. So yeah, there are characteristics you're going to see, some that aren't necessarily inherent in dyslexia, such as executive functioning problems and, and attention issues, because you have people that don't have dyslexia that have those, but some that could be a byproduct of the same underlying issues. So if there's some phonological issues that are producing the reading, phonological issues can produce other things, including word finding. So among children with dyslexia, there's more likely that they have a word finding problem. Well, what's a word finding problem? Stop and think about this. We have, we have many different aspects of our memory. When we think of memory, long-term memory I'm talking about, not working memory, but long-term memory, we're all oh, have a bad memory. Well, from a standpoint of cognitive scientists, saying that you have a bad memory is like going to a doctor and say, I don't feel good. It's just too generic. See, to a cognitive scientist, you say, which aspect of your long-term memory? We have semantic long-term memory that has to do with our um, understanding of concepts. We have episodic long-term memory. Think of the word episode. It has to do with uh, experiences. We have motor long-term memory. It's like riding a bike. We have procedural long-term memory. You know how to drive a car while you're still talking with someone and, and distracted and you're still driving just fine. You're an autopilot. Um, we have face, or excuse me, we have we have auditory memory. That's why I knew it was a snowblower and not a truck going by. We have phonological memory, which I'm, this is where this is leading to, phonological memory. And then we have face memory. We have orthographic memory for words and we have visual memory. So we have three different, at least three different types of memory that involve information coming in through our eyes, but they are different memory systems. We have at least two different uh types of memory that involve information coming into our ears, the auditory, environmental sounds, and phonological. Okay, that's a long way around the barn of saying, if you have problems with phonology, you're gonna have a problem with vocabulary to some degree or word finding. Because think of the term vocabulary. We teach vocabulary like it's just a singular type of memory. Vocabulary is making use of at least two of our memory systems, our semantic memory system and our phonological memory system. Here's an illustration. We all have had the experience when we're talking with someone and you say, you're thinking about something, you go, what's the word where you, uh, you know, it's kind of like, and you start talking around it. Well, your semantic memory is doing its job perfectly. You, the concept's there, but your phonological memory is failing you. What is the word that attaches to that concept? So vocabulary is a combination of the concept and the word attached to that concept. Vocabulary is not just one thing, it's at least, at least, and maybe more than that. So it's, it's, think about a more com, a common one we have similar. We have phonological memory problems with faces, right? So we remember the face, but we don't remember the phonology, the person's name. Same thing happens with concepts. So if you have issues with phonology, it could lead to dyslexia, but also could lead to problems with word finding. So, so anyway, to sum this up, what I'm saying is, yeah, there could be other things associated with dyslexia that are directly related to the same general causal phenomenon of phonology, uh, weaker phonology than average. Um, and, and then there could be others that are just epiphenomenal. There's really no causal relationship. Mm. Um, well, and that was such a good explanation. I forgot what my other question related to your prior point was, but... <laughs> I want to circle around on um, when we've spoken before, we talked about within the balanced literacy instruction versus 
a structured literacy based instruction, the use of context in teaching a child to read. And you had a really great um, explanation for why that doesn't necessarily help the child learn how to read when it sounds so reasonable. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, there, there are several different aspects related to that. Skilled readers do not rely on context. Words jump out at them instantaneously. So that's what's called a bottom-up process. Bottom-up meaning from the letters to the sounds to the vocabulary. A top-down process would start with higher level things such as context, vocabulary, et cetera, and work its way down to the letters and kind of, you know, the letters may confirm what you kind of thought or what you're going to guess, et cetera. So skilled readers do not, uh, there have been studies of adult skilled readers where they do what they call garden path, a garden path, uh, what would I say? P paradigm is actually the word they would use, but, but a technique, uh, a research technique that they use that involves a garden path sentence. So the garden path sentence is when you start reading a couple so lines and it gets to the very end and they'll have a, a good size multisyllabic word that looks just like another word that people would be expecting but it's not that word. And most good readers catch that. Well, where's context in that? No, the bottom up forced them to go, whoa, this doesn't belong here. That's a typo. Now, the reality is it can work the other way. We've all experienced, especially if it's something that we wrote, but it still can be someone else where you miss a typo, et cetera. Um, but for the most part, it, the bottom up processes are very much involved in skilled readers. Weak readers are the ones that rely on context. So weak readers, they're not good at sounding out words and they're not good at remembering words. So what's left? Using context. Well, I told you I read classical Greek. I've been doing it for almost 40 years now. Um, I took, um, actually during one of my graduate programs, I, I went across town and took some intermediate Greek courses from Harvard University. And you know, they say, when someone went to Harvard University, you know that within first the first 20 minutes after meeting them, because they work it into the conversation. Look, for it's been 35 minutes. So I, I you know, anyway, so I did I did two uh, graduate level courses in classical Greek at Harvard. And and uh, you know, the problem is I don't have nobody speaks classical Greek. You know, modern Greek, you know, I, I, I have a colleague from Greece that's a reading researcher, and I showed him some classical stuff and he could, he could kind of read it and figure it out, just like we can read some older English type of things. But it's not something that's fluent. It's not, nobody speaks it the way. Okay, so what's the problem? I don't have a language system to connect it to. So I am constantly sounding out words. Some words jump out at me, but I'm sounding out words and I'm using context a lot. Why? Because I'm functioning like an individual with a reading disability. Okay, so so I get to experience because I, I I deliberately keep it up. So I read a little bit every day, and so I, I kind of know what it's like to have a reading disability. But it's easy for me to brush it aside because I don't need it. But what if I did need it? So I have to rely heavily on context to figure out some stuff. Otherwise, I'm running to a dictionary every two minutes, right? So um, so that's the uh, that is the characteristic of a weak reader. So in a sense, what's happening is that. If we teach kids to lead with context, then we're teaching kids to function like weak readers, not function like strong readers. But what happens is skilled readers, they're taught that and they discard it because they realize, hey, I can sound these words out pretty good. They figure out the code, even if they're not taught the code and they're remembering words. So what would you need context for when a word jumps out at you? So context is, is uh, so, so it's not effective, but it's also problematic because we need to deal with that internal structure of the word to sound out words and also to remember words. Word level reading functions on at least two levels. One level is the, um, able, the ability to sound out an unfamiliar word. That's the most effective way to determine a new word. The context is, is, is quite unreliable. We have a lot of studies to show that. And then we have to remember words. That's the second level. So sounding out a new and unfamiliar word and then remembering words so you don't have to sound it out again. Those are both uh, well in, established in kids who are good readers. Mm -hmm. But you don't get there by guessing from context. You get there by, if you're not taught the code of written English, there's plenty of people, I can't give you a number, 40%, 50%, maybe as many as 60% of the population have enough phonological skills that even if they're not taught the code, they figured out 
pretty quickly, you know, over the period of first, second, and third grade. So by third grade, they can read nonsense words. How can you possibly read nonsense words if you weren't taught the code? You figured the code out on your own. We don't have children that are good readers that were never taught phonics that look at a nonsense word like blat or prep and go, oh, I have no idea where to begin. They're gonna say blat and prop, right? So they figured out what they weren't taught and that's how they became a good reader. Not by following, guessing from context, they figured that out. And then they're good at remembering words through this process called orthographic mapping. That's how we get that string of letters into our long-term memory so that it jumps out at us instantly. Um, so here's the problem. If you teach kids, especially weaker kids at bottom, 10%, 20%, 30%, maybe even 40%. If you teach them to guess from context, you're drawing their attention away from sounding out a word through the entire word that's gonna help them with the first level of word reading. And you're going to uh, steer them away from noticing the sequence of letters that's gonna help them remember the word. So the two levels of word reading are sort of being circumvented when we draw attention away from this, that. that. And yet some of the, the, for lack of a better term, gurus or the leaders in the whole language movement uh, were basically saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't, uh, you don't go down to the individual letters and sounds. That's that's just not right. You know, we don't we don't memorize different noses and eyes and, and cheekbones and stuff for faces, but we learn faces. So this was their kind of reasoning. It doesn't work for reading. It's not how it works. Yeah. Um, you you brought up something I definitely near and dear to my heart as an advocate: nonsense words. <laughs> I know when I was advocating for my own child in the elementary years, I could not get the school team to align on nonsense words at all. It was just, it was like a non-starter. And their primary pushback was they didn't know how to, um, for lack of a better phrase, they didn't know how to grade him for that. And they, they weren't hearing my argument that the nonsense word was a great tool to reinforce the different rules of language, right? The different rules with consonants and with vowels and with blends, et cetera. And so I'd love for you to talk about nonsense words and why that can be such a valuable instruction tool. Well, I, I, I don't know if I would argue it, it's a valuable instruction tool, although I'm not against using it that way. I, I think, first of all, a lot of teachers get a little nervous about nonsense words. It's almost like they have, they're afraid someone's gonna come to them and say, expect them to say to the kids, okay, kids, we're going to do our 20 minutes of nonsense word paragraph reading today. Uh, you know, so if, if you are using them instructionally, you're just sprinkling them in a little bit here and there. The power of nonsense words from my perspective is for assessment. How well does the child know the code? And nonsense words could help us with that. But I think if all the other things are in place in terms of teaching children, I, I don't know that you need nonsense words in terms of instruction, but I'm not against using them to illustrate, maybe illustrate a certain uh, you know, pattern or, or something. So, so I'm not, uh, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. The reality is, here's a perspective that I have on all this. We know the basic skills involved in basketball. Um, and we know what those are, and we know what skilled basketball players can do. So if we want other individuals to become skilled at basketball, don't you think we want to work on the things that skilled basketball players are good at? And so, um, most people learn to read without ever doing nonsense words. So that's, that can't be essential. It's kind of a workaround. Now that's okay, because sometimes you have to work around the fact that these kids don't know the code well. But I think we also have to know that there are certain things like, let, let's say, say, for example, um, the, in the classic Orton-Gillingham approaches, they talk about the six syllable types. Actually, only five of them apply to single syllable words. But uh, so let's talk about those. So most individuals could not, they're good readers, could not articulate for you what the syllable types are. And they definitely can't highlight the exceptions to those syllable types or even the exception of the exceptions. So that knowledge base is not a necessary component, but it has a value instructionally because those that don't figure out the code, what happens is skilled readers learn through a process called statistical learning. Statistical learning is when you see a bunch of instances and you draw some sort of a, notice a pattern. 
Uh, example would be a child coming in the back door, three years old, and said, I just run around the back, the backyard. Well, the parents never sat that kid down and talked about ED endings on past tense verbs. But the child inferred that from many exposures to language. Well, in a similar way, children learn, every, every person who's a skilled reader knows the six syllable types. They just don't know that they know it. So it's still a skill they need. How do we know that? Because if you give them nonsense words in each of the syllable types, they get it right. Uh, they know when the, when the sound is gonna be a long or short, you know, the classical way of putting it, uh, they, they get it right. So they develop it, but they develop it through statistical learning and they develop it below the surface of their awareness. So what we're trying to do instructionally for children that don't pick up on that, because kids with dyslexia are not good at statistical learning when it comes to letters and sounds, they're just not. And so we're making that explicit for them. So my point is that we do things that are out of the ordinary for these children, but we have to know what the goal is. We want to work backward from what the skill is. And the two skills kids need for word reading are number one, to be able to be good at sounding out new and unfamiliar words. That's how we got, that's how we developed this huge data bank of familiar words. We didn't have a teacher or parent leaning over us every time we came across a new word, we figured it out. Uh, and so, uh, that's the first thing, and they have to become good at remembering words. And for children that have good phoneme levels, oral skills, they can they naturally become good at both of those, regardless of, uh, to, to, to quote Liberman and Liberman from the late 80s, you know, regardless of how in, in effective or inappropriate the instruction is, they're going to figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I forgot that I had wanted to make a comment on your prior point when you were talking about reading through classical Greek and how that was more of like how a dyslexic reader is struggling to read. Um, my undergraduate degree is in English and I had an entire semester on Chaucer, but we had to read Chaucer in its original English <laughs> and translate it. <laughs> and yeah. I never thought about it from that perspective, but that, that was genius because you were skipping ahead, trying to find other words to go, I, I don't understand what this is. And, and two, because we were having to translate it, at least we we had an old English to new English dictionary that we were using. But and then two, um, I'm an extremely proficient reader, but every now and then I will still come across a word that I've not seen before. And I remember I was reading Seidenberg's Language at the Speed of Light, and he used the word um, I may pronounce it wrong, in inculcate. And I had never heard that word before. And as I was flying through the text, I I read inoculate. And I got about three words on and went, wait a minute, that word wasn't inoculate. And, you know, stop me dead in my tracks. <laughs> and I went back and I tried to pronounce it and, you know, I sounded it out. I finally, I couldn't say it correctly so that Siri on my phone could define the word for me. I had to pull up, pull up Safari and type it in and <laughs> the whole shebang. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and I did get a question from a parent that I wanted uh, to ask you as well. So she said specifically, based on your emphasis that testing should provide the information to drive instruction, what advice do you have for parents to get dyslexia teachers to read and act upon the data from evaluations instead of just following the test from the remediation program? As an example, a student gets 76 on a phonemic proficiency, 79 on phonological processing on the Y at four, but the remediation program indicates he's mastered phonological awareness. Um, so the teacher starts student on chapter five out of six with morphology. Um, and then the teacher, and please bear in mind, I'm not teacher bashing because I, I, I don't do that. This is a question where a parent's trying to advocate for their child. The teacher denies the parent request to consult the Y at four or the C top two scores or to address the phonemic deficits cited within the evaluation. This seems to be a fairly common occurrence where only the remediation program test results are used to plan the child's instruction. Yeah, I, I don't know how much I can comment because there, there's so many question, follow-up questions I have about that situation. And I mean, I, I worked in a school uh, as a school psychologist doing evaluations for 28 years, and I had a 22 year, over, year overlap with my 28, also 28 year work at the university. And so I know, I know about those, you know, all the details of that, but I, like I said, I have a bunch of follow-up questions, but here's what I would say. The remediation program is not normed. 
So a norm test like the Wyatt 4 tells you how a child is doing comparing to other children across the country. And if she's get if he or she is getting a 76 and a 79, that's a serious, that's that's way down there. That's in the, you know, so let's see if I remember, because there's no direct conversion process, you know, 75 is fifth percentile. Okay, and 80 is ninth percentile. So you're basically talking between fifth and ninth percentile. That's very, very weak. I don't care what their remediate what their remediation program says. These kids, they can't dribble. They can't dribble. And and yet we're just saying, oh, he can dribble, put him in the game. So um I don't know how, you know, the best way of convincing them, that would not be a, a reading research question. That would be a question from social psychology and that has to do with how people interact with each other and how you convince people to do things. There's, that's a huge area in, unto itself. Uh, but I think the important thing is to realize that if they say they're doing well with phonological awareness, here's one of the problems that we're having is that if a child can segment a word, tell me all the sounds in hat, at, or a child can blend. What, what word am I saying? R -at red. If they can do that, that is an ending first grade skill. Kids at the end of first grade that are on target for can do that just fine. But we have data to show that phonemic awareness continues to grow and doesn't level out until about third grade. Hey, that's when you have your sight word explosion by third grade and kids are absorbing new words. I don't think it's coincidental. And so we have data and how, what is that data how do we get that data? We get the data in a number of ways, but I think the most pertinent for this, such as the Wyatt Four, is when you look at what grows between first grade and third grade in terms of phonemic awareness, speed and automaticity. And so it's the speed and automaticity that these kids are developing. If a kid can do it slowly, um, so I've done studies with kids and uh, th there's other data out there from some pretty, pretty big data sets that show that the correlation on a phonemic test, it exists for the instant responding to the item, not for whether you get it correct or not. So if you get items, a bunch of items and they're correct, but they're not a fast response, that does not correlate with reading. Um, so the, the automaticity of the phonemic skills is what we need to be sure children are developing. That's what skilled readers can do. Yeah. So what I'm saying is we can create the impression that a kid has, I did that for years. So the, the PASS test, the phonological awareness screening test, which, which is free, it's at thepasstest.com. You got to put the word the in front of it. The phonological awareness screening test. That developed as a result of, it, it, it started out as a Rosner and Simon test from 1971, Journal of Learning Disabilities. But I was giving an intermediate version of that test, and I was giving it to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders with dyslexia. And I'd say, like, you know, you start out with easy items, say baseball, but don't say base. But then you get to the harder items, say sky, sky. Now say it again instead of say wool. Sly, this is what they did. Took them four or five seconds, they got it right. I didn't know any better. They, I gave them credit for it, right? Well, in uh, October of 2000, I screened an entire third grade class of kids. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. These the kids that were good readers, you'd say, say sky. And they've never done this before. It was in a whole language pool. Say sky, sky. Now say it again instead of say oh, sly. Like, wow, where'd that come from? So I'm thinking, wait a minute. The children who responded instantly are good readers. The children who got it right, who are older, one, two, or three years older than these kids, were doing it slowly, but got it right. Now, some of those older kids didn't even get them right, but many of them did. And yet, hmm, something's going on with this. So I thought I came up with a new idea only to find out it had already been in the research literature in the 90s, right? But that speed of access is what's important because when we read, we need to be able to notice the phonemes in the spoken word to connect that word to that string of letters. And when we read and we come across a new word, we don't, like when you came across that new word you mentioned, we don't uh, stop and run and get flashcards. We, once we know what it is, we move on because we're reading for meaning. Well, in that split second, in that split second, we are connecting the phonemes in speech to the phonemes in the word. That's what orthographic mapping is. So we need automaticity. That can't happen without automaticity. If it's slow, like those fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, it's just not going to happen. So 
the automaticity of phonemic skills is essential for becoming a good reader. And that's what skilled readers can do. And we have data from some large data samples that we're, we're actually working on to get published, but also from samples that I, I've generated where you have, I don't know if you know, like how a scatter plot works. Mm -hmm. You know, scatter plot shows that you can be kids that are weak at automaticity with phonemes are weak readers. Kids that are really strong with automaticity are strong readers. That's fine. But here's where it gets interesting. You have children in this, if you have four quadrants, you have children in the quadrant that says kids that are good at phonemic proficiency, have instant phonemic proficiency, but they're not good readers. But what's missing, we have an empty quadrant. We don't have any children who are good readers that lack phonemic proficiency. So that's pretty, that's pretty um, important. That's pretty important. Okay. Um, so so it's not enough to do well on a classical traditional phoneme blending or segmentation task. It's not enough. Both fourth, fifth, and sixth grade dyslexics did just fine. And yet they were dyslexic and they had they had phoneme, they had phonemic uh, awareness problem. Well, see, we have to distinguish between phonemic awareness and phonemic mm -hmm. automaticity, which I call phonemic proficiency. It's just I'm using the term proficiency. Um, instead of automaticity, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. So phonemic awareness is not enough. Those fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, many of them had phonemic awareness. They were aware of the sounds, they worked on it enough and figured it out, but they didn't have the automaticity and proficiency. And that's what's needed in terms of remembering words when we come across new words. Um, and I think that that's an amazing point that I, um, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, I wanna be respectful of your time because we, we've been on, uh, for almost uh, 55 minutes at this point. But I wanted to get your thoughts on encoding, spelling, and writing instruction within reading instruction itself. Speaking as a parent of a dyslexic child who you know, was able to provide private remediation to my child, all of the remediation was reading focused. There was no writing instruction in there. And attending a school district that was a balanced literacy based school district using a mix of Fontes and Pinnell and Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, there's no writing instruction within that. Well, my child also happens to be dysgraphic, of course. And so <laughs> you were talking about, you know, additional SLDs and comorbidities earlier. I And one of the things that I'm passionate about is trying to bring a lot more focus on the conversation about the criticality of writing instruction, right? So within everything that we've been discussing, where does encoding and spelling and writing fit into all of this in, in your thoughts? Well, I always get nervous when people ask about spelling. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why. <laughs> I have read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of research articles, research reports, research reviews on word level reading, among other things related. I've probably read, and, and many of those include something, you know, spelling test or something in there, okay? But I've probably read a dozen research articles and research reports specifically on spelling and spelling development. So that's not my specialty and that's a whole nother area. But I will tell you this, the correlation between uh, spelling and word reading is very high. And based on how we understand how we remember words, it's the order of letters that's important. So please take what I'm saying is not, I mean, any, anything that I've said, other than the, obviously the illustrations or stories from, from working in a school, anything I've said is two mouse clicks away uh, on my, I have it all organized on my thousands of research studies on my uh, computer. This is not. So take this as a, this is my extending what, what I do know. Given how we remember words, the orthographic sequence, I would think that spelling, I would strongly encourage having kids write and spell because that is helping to reinforce that letter order. Uh, if they don't have any access to the phonemes very well or whatever, this could help reinforce that. But if they don't have much access to the phoneme, then it becomes like a memorization thing and it's not really anchoring, it's not sticking. So I would, I would strongly encourage that. Think about the fact how we adults, uh, if you're adult skilled reader, there are a lot of words you can read easily, but it's hard to spell when it comes time to spell it. So there's a bit of a gap between our orthographic lexicon for recognizing words and our orthographic lexicon for producing words through the spelling with precision. So you need even greater precision in spelling than you need in word recognition. So I think for most of us, there probably aren't words that we can spell that we can't read. 
So if you can spell it, you can probably read it. Now that is not always true for kids. And you know, kids, you can have kids that actually can read uh, spell words and then when it comes time to read it, it's like they've never seen it before. A lot of that I think has to do with maybe a visual memorization on a, on a spelling test, but also it could be our mnemonics. Think about this. How did we all learn in third grade to, to spell the word together? To get her. It's great, we'll never forget it, right? But here's the problem. When it comes to reading, the TH belong together. You don't split them up. So that count, that's counter to the orthographic uh, pattern that we need for reading. So there could be a case where now you can spell together, but when you see it, you go, huh? That's not true for adults, I don't think, uh, that I've known of any cases. So as adults, if we can spell it, we can read it. So that is an, my amateurish approach to saying, I think that we really need to get kids spelling words both by hand. And I do know, because some of the studies I've read, um, having them spell on a computer, that's nice, but writing beats the computer in terms of them more likely to remember it. Um, so that doesn't mean you don't ever have them spell on the computer. That's not what it's saying, but you don't just have them spell on the computer. Writing has, uh, actual handwriting is gonna help with that. And um, just, the, just the whole concept of how we uh, remember a sequence of letters. Uh, so to, just to kind of reinforce that, I think it's very important. I, I like how you do together. Um, my mother told me to pronounce determined as Dieter minded because I could never <laughs> spell it correctly. And so every time I go to, I mean, at my age still, every time I go to write the word determined, my brain says Dieter minded. <laughs> well, Dr. Lena Airy, who is the one who developed the concept of orthographic mapping, she has recommended creating alternative bogus pronunciations yeah. to help. And she's even did a study that showed that that did seem to help kids as a mnemonic. Yeah, there's, I, I know that I definitely have some more. Unfortunately, uh, Dieter Minded is the only one that like pops in straight into my head. I know that one of my cheats is saying parable, but I can't remember what word that that actually applies to until I actually go to spell the word and then my brain goes parable and I, I get my vowels correct in the word instead mm -hmm. of backwards. <laughs> yeah. So um, again, I wanna be respectful of your time. You've been so generous with agreeing to come on today and share your incredible knowledge, your expertise with us and I'm, I'm so grateful that you were willing to do this. So thank you so much. No problem. I'm just, I, I, I'm not that smart of a guy. I, I just rely on other people's, you know, I've read, I've done a lot of studies myself, but I, I've just read so much. And I always find it interesting that people are, are like, oh, wow, this is great, Dave. You're great. No. I'm just a UPS guy. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's like, do people get all excited when a package comes? Do they, do they, do they gush all over the UPS guy? Yeah, but from my perspective, I think that you you probably get people reacting to you that way because as a parent- It's new to them. I'm the one that delivered the package. So they're all excited. I understand that. Right. But as the parent of a child that struggles, you know, has struggled with the reading instruction to have somebody, you presented in a very logical way. You know, this conversation is very much on my level. You could have chosen to use words that would have me pulling out a dictionary trying to follow you <laughs> And you didn't. And I think parents definitely respond to that. So um, I'm so grateful that you were able to, to do this. <laughs> oh, sure. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. And everyone, this is going to be uploaded momentarily to our podcast and our YouTube channel. So check us out there. All right. Everybody have a great day. Yep. Bye now. Bye.